Okay, now we're going to make another useful assumption that this data set doesn't hold to, and that's the zero offset assumption. Sources and receivers are in the same place at the same time. So we're going to conduct our survey like a chirp survey. We're going to move across the landscape, and whenever we, we have a source go off, the receiver is right there at it. Okay, then we move the experiment, we, have, we set off the source, the receiver is right there. Uh, we set off the source, the receiver is right there. Okay, the S and G coordinate are the same. All right, so we don't have to distinguish between them anymore. X sub S and X sub G are the same, so we just call it X. That's the surface location of the trace, which is exactly the same as the surface location of the source. Now, what happens here uh, under our assumptions is that the um, uh, the reflected wave, uh, as you can see, uh, if you think about it, you know we send a wave down to the reflector and we get the normal reflection back. Okay, the reflection at a direction that's normal to the um, to the, the the slope of the of the surface of the reflecting surface at that point. Okay, and the returned wave, the reflected wave, takes exactly the same path back. Okay. This is really this is really going to make it easy, all right. And okay, we know uh, I've explained how we have to, you know, over process and over assume from our land data. So you know, land data is still difficult to get into this form, into the zero offset form. We got to do stacking. Then we're going to be, you know, stacking itself is a uh, NMO um, correction and and CDP stacking. It's a uh, um, you know, it's fraught with errors and interpretations, and and we um, uh, we only get the flattest structure image. You know, I showed you examples of that, uh, and we only see some of the structures, uh, and things are smeared out and not as not as easy. But if we have you know chirp data or marine data, then this is easy. Okay, we we have good zero offset data. Okay, so uh, now the now the problem is, is that, as you can see, the, the midpoint, which is, again, it's just x, right? x sub m is the same as x sub s, which is the same as x sub g, right? The midpoint, the source, the receiver, they're all located at exactly the same spot. So again, the midpoint is x, right? But that's not the same as the depth point. The depth point is, is away from that. And so we're going to figure out how to migrate the depth point, uh, we're going to figure out how to migrate the assumed midpoint location to the true depth point location. And you can see that's going to depend on the, uh, uh, on the dip of the structure. So where we have zero dip, right? Uh, what's, what's migration going to do? Is migration going to do anything where we have zero dip just from this, this diagram? No. Does, we, don't need to, we don't need migration if we have zero dip. Okay. So, you know, migration will will be the correction most needed when we're trying to resolve dipping structure. Okay, so now um, we need to go on to fifteen. Okay, so I already talked about uh, uh, how uh, on land we don't have true zero offset data, but since Graham has has, uh, has gotten here, I've been uh, educated a lot about uh, how how uh, there are some the, some really great zero offset data sets out there. Okay, Graham has been responsible for collecting a lot of them. Um, so um, uh, and and just a reminder that you know lateral homogeneity is the key to making the stack look like true zero offset data. The stacked multi-offset data uh, will look the most like zero offset data when we have lateral homogeneity. When velocity uh, and reflectivity okay, are only depend on z. And, and so you can see kind of the notation. You know, If I say here the velocity field uh, has uh, 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 arguments x and z, Okay, I really do mean a 2D varying uh, velocity field, you know, laterally heterogeneous, vertically heterogeneous. But if I say, okay, velocity that only depends on z, 
there's uh, the assumption, I'm making an assumption there usually, that the velocity is laterally homogeneous, does not depend on x, uh, but it's vertically heterogeneous, it does depend on z. Okay, so that's uh, you know, layer cake geology, like you find in the Colorado Plateau in some places, uh, you know, like away from upheaval dome. And, um, and we, can, we can handle that with, uh, with land data and stacking. We can make it into approximated zero offset data. So uh, we're going to assume we have marine data here, true zero offset surveys. Uh, and we are going to um, allow, partially allow lateral heterogeneity. Okay, we're going to allow dipping beds, right? Because if we don't allow lateral heterogeneity, there's, you know, the migration isn't going to, isn't going to do anything, right? So we've got to allow our reflectivity uh, to dip. Uh, but we're going to keep velocity as, um, uh, as laterally homogeneous. Okay? And uh, uh, so that, that, uh, that allows us to uh, uh, have some hope of processing our land data. And it's not too bad a restriction in processing our, our uh, it's not too simple for processing our marine data which will be better, but at least it gives us a chance for the land data. Okay? Now, uh, we will, we will uh, even in, in this uh, half of the course here, we're going to be able to eliminate, um, um, partially eliminate that, that lateral velocity homogeneity uh, assumption. And uh, we'll be able to deal a little bit with slowly varying, slowly laterally varying velocity. Uh, at the end of the class. Okay, now I need to explain something about seismic sections. Okay, our experiments in physical space, right? So here's a reflector in X and Z. Okay, and you know it's got the displaced uh, depth points from the midpoints. Um, and but we record our uh, zero offset data, our chirp data, say, and it's a wave field. Okay, it's in time, time not depth. Okay, it, and and uh, marine data is really a, a, it's a recording of pressure at each uh, transducer. It's their hydrophones, and their pressure transducers. So if we had them all nicely calibrated, we could back out to uh, pressure. Pressure is a um, pressure is a scalar, right? So we don't have to worry about vector wave fields here, um, and that that will help simplify things. So. Uh, we're looking at a scalar wave field of pressure and how it varies in x, right, which is the distance along our 2D line, and then time. All right. Now, uh, we sometimes imagine that we're looking at the time sections. And if you go and look at, at Amy's thesis, right, there's all these sections in there, and they're all in time. But you know, she's talking about them as if they're depth. Okay. And um, uh, and that's uh, you know so we're you know in our heads and in, in our theses, uh, in our papers, right? We just you know we we remove the uh, the time axis and we we put a z axis on it, a depth axis, okay? Um, and uh, for Amy's thesis, it works great because um, you know. You might look at her thesis and, and you're thinking, oh, you know, she's got these uh, these huge dips in there, you know, like 70 degree dips, uh, and there are reflectors at these dips. But but no, you know, you read uh, you read the thesis and you discover, oh, she's got 30 times, 50 times vertical exaggeration on all her figures. So all the dips in there are a few degrees, okay, virtually flat, okay. So so actually, you know. It's it's easy, you know. Amy can, she could substitute the z-axis for the time axis with a simple time to depth conversion, okay, and uh, and and she's reasonably accurate, you know, in in what she what she came up with, okay. Um, so uh, because because her uh, her structures are not dipping very uh, at, at very high degree. But if they're dipping more than five degrees, okay, you know, especially if they're dipping, say, fifteen degrees, all right, that's where we need 
migration. That's where we need imaging to produce a cross section from the wave field. So another way of thinking about migration, <clears throat> you know, it's it's uh, <clears throat> it's it's also converting the wave field, the pressure wave field P of x and t, to a reflectivity cross section, which is R of x and z. Okay, and the process that does that conversion, time section to depth section, we call migration. And and the migration is the term, you know, it's moving the midpoints to the depth points. All right. Uh, but technically, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do a wave field transformation from the pressure field in time to the reflectivity section in Z. Okay. So here's our, our migration objective. And I finally threw away the lined paper. Um, we're going we're gonna to produce an image, okay, a cross-section image of reflectivity and depth from our recorded data section, our chirp data section, say, uh, of, um, uh, of recorded pressure in time. <clears throat> OK? Now, what are the two things that we're going to need to do? This is like the, uh, the process flow now. OK? Um, you know, this is what migration does. That's the objective, okay. But the definition is is made here by Clairbaut in terms of what it is. What is the process? Migration is a process of downward continuation, uh, constrained or stopped or followed by an imaging condition, okay. Downward continuation plus imaging condition. I may abbreviate this. If I start talking fast, I'll abbreviate it as DC plus IC, okay? Downward continuation plus imaging condition. So every migration that, that I've ever worked on has some sort of, you know, there's some sort of process, uh, and we're going to look at it in this class in terms of, you know, wave field transformations, all right? has some sort of process that is the downward continuation, and it has some sort of process that is the imaging condition. Okay. Um, and the, the processes can be incredibly complex. Um, there are migrations that use uh, inverse elastic modeling, you know, feeding the data back into the stations and reverse time modeling um, you know, for all the multiple reflections and everything. Um, uh, and that's what they, and, and that takes, of course, uh, huge computational efforts for, for most, you know, for, for any industry data set, it would take huge computational efforts. Uh, that's what they use for downward continuation, okay? And the imaging condition might involve, uh, you know, ray trace uh, tomographic inversions, okay, um, of the, and it may involve uh, cross, the imaging condition may be achieved by uh, cross correlation in, 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 in essence getting the um, uh, the empirical greens function from every source receiver pair okay so so migration can get incredibly co uh, complex and uh, uh, and compute intensive um, we'll also see that that it can be incredibly simple and we're going to start with the assumptions that let it be fast and easy and simple Okay, it could be as simple as picking up and adding in the amplitude of the uh, um, of the uh, uh, of the trace of the time trace at the time given by the imaging condition, and the imaging condition can be, you know, a very simple, uh, um, you know, spherical propagation. Okay, so uh, uh, there there are always these two parts. And, and, and in fact, in the next few weeks, we're going to see um, you know, four or five different ways of, of implementing the downward continuation. We'll stick with one imaging condition okay, that won't be too hard. Uh, but uh, I, you know, part of what I do here is show you all the options for the downward continuation. All right. So uh, 
we're going to start with the imaging condition. And uh, so right away, I'm going to define a, um, a model, you know, a view of, uh, of the physical situation that uh, is going to give us a good imaging condition for zero offset data. And it's, it's going to be a useful one um, under our assumptions, OK, and very simple. So we have a zero offset experiment. OK, uh, we've got this reflector down here, and we have the the uh, the coincidence sources and receivers, and we have uh, the same path down as the reflection takes back up. Okay, for every source and receiver, the reflection takes the same path. The normal reflection takes the same path down as it does back up. Okay, so now imagine in that cross section that the reflectors ex explode. So at zero time. You know, when at the time the source goes off, instead of the source going off at the surface, the whole reflector explodes at the same at time zero. And then if you take whatever velocity you had, and we're we're going to talk about a constant velocity first, and you divide it by two, right? Then uh, the waves will go up from the reflector to the receivers along the same. It's along the right path, right? It's along the right path. And because we divided the velocity by two, it's going to get there at the same time. It only has to traverse that path once, not in uh, not in both directions. Okay, what do you guys want me to bring to the seismo potluck? <laughs> what do you guys like? Pizza? Um, I haven't seen. What have other people signed up for? Mm, we'll have to find out. Okay. All right. All right. That's two good suggestions. I like that. Meatballs. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. Great suggestions. Uh, let me think about them. All right. So these two cases are are uh, kinematically equivalent for constant velocity. Okay. And we'll explore. You know what what can break this this exploding reflector model later. Okay. The ray paths are the same. Um, you know, it's just uh, uh, they're they're sing It's a single traverse instead of a double traverse, right? It doesn't. It, it, I hope it makes sense to you that the the wave does exactly the same thing traveling one way as it does traveling the other way. Okay. You know, whatever. Once we know the path, it doesn't matter whether it's traveling left to right across the path or well here up or up or down acro uh, across the same path. Okay, so uh, uh, that's how we concoct the exploding reflector model. So uh, we're going to assume exploding reflectors until further notice, and and we're going to have to remember as well that uh, we're going to have to remember to migrate with v over two. All right, and in in Clairbout's book and in in some of the uh, codes, you know that's not clear. You know we just use a velocity. And uh, uh, and we haven't divided it by two, okay. So watch out for that. All right, that's a that can be a problem. Um, so you know, very often here, uh, I'll I'll show you uh, uh, just a, there'll just be a v here, and uh, and it's it's the half velocity. All right, and I haven't you know flagged those half velocities with any particular color or anything so useful as that. Okay, so. Um, all right. Now, since the reflectors explode at time t equals zero, that's when we stop downward continuing. We stop downward continuing at t equals zero. And at that point, that's where the data should be collapsed back on the reflector. OK? And we'll, we'll illustrate downward continuation um, you know, once we, we understand uh, how to how to do it? You know, a couple of different ways. Okay, so the objective now. All right, so that's the that's the imaging condition. We got half of migration. Okay, we got it wired. The other half is downward continuation. So uh, let let's define it first. The objective, not not the workflow, but the objective, is to reconstruct our surface data to simulate an experiment at some other depth z. Okay. 
we, uh, we, our recorded data are from depth z equals 0. Okay, we record a certain wave here at this x and here at this other value, at this other position x. Okay, we, and here's the surface, right? And, uh, and you know, this guy uh, dropped the hammer, I guess. He's, he's standing on the surface, but he's not holding the hammer. Um, and we have sunk the survey virtually, okay, to this non-zero depth z. And then we record, you know, it's as if we, it's the wave field we would record at depth z, okay? We have the data we recorded at z equals zero, and what we're, what we're going to figure out here is how do we transform that data into the data at the depth uh, non-zero uh, depth z. So, so really what we're doing is we're realizing, oh, our, our, our 2D seismic record, right? And here, here's why it's so important in, in, in this class to look at the, in this part of the class, to look at the arguments to, to you know, whatever I'm showing you. Okay, we've got a pressure wave field P. Uh, it's, it's recorded at all these different positions, X. It's recorded at all these different times, T. Okay, and, but now I'm adding another dimension. Okay, it's, now I'm saying it's, this wave field, our data, are recorded at the surface at Z equals zero. And using downward con continuation, I can <clears throat> uh, take that wave field down to the same x, okay, and to the same time scale, but also to any depth I want z. So now instead of a, you know, after downward continuation, instead of having just a 2D wave field, I've got a 3D wave field. I'm adding this additional dimension, okay. Uh, right. Well, so here's a here's a typical Clairbout, um, um, you know, kind of sidebar, uh, but he he puts these in you know into the main text because uh, it's this kind of physical thinking that that he's trying to promote. All right. So um, uh, we can start with with some very simple wave principles. And we can come up with a downward continuation method. All right. So here's how. Um, we have linear waves. All right. Linear waves obey Huygens' principle. All right. Which means that uh, you can take, uh, you know, any wave front and any source, uh, and you can. So we have this this curved line source. You know, if you if you imagine burying. A, uh, a length of primer cord in our 2D section, okay, all right, and and you know Huygens' principle makes sense if you've studied uh, uh, since you've studied um, calculus because you know you can break up any continuous curve into discrete points, right, and the accuracy just depends on the distance, you know, how many points you break it up into, right. If you once once you know here I've drawn uh, just six points, and it's clear that that it's not going to be a great approximation. But if I had a million points in here, it would be a superb approximation to that continuous curve. Okay. So any configuration of exploding reflectors, okay, we can represent as the sum of individual point explosions. All right. So uh, that means that we can look at one. You know. We could look at, at, at one individual point explosion, and that will help us figure out how to, if we, can, if we can downward continue one point explosion, then just by adding a whole bunch of other ones, we can downward continue a, a very complex um, reflectivity section, you know, which has exploding reflectors, you know, reflectors exploding everywhere, all over the place. Okay. If we can understand one, then by Huygens' principle, we can just add them together and get make as complex a, a structure as we want. So, what is the representation of the wave front from an exploding spot in the seismic traces? Remember, this is now this is incredibly simple. I mean, we're we're assuming uh, you know no directivity of the source. We're assuming the source is 
is uh, essentially infinite frequency, right? We're taking all the easy geometric assumptions. Okay, so it's a it's a it's a uh, uh, it's a spike explosion. Um, you know, it's it's got infinite frequency band. Uh, it's uh, so it's got infinite sharpness. Um, it's um, you got linear propagation only. There's no near source effects that are nonlinear. Um, we got constant velocity. We've got two D. You know all those assumptions. Um, you know make it really easy. Okay. So if I you know here's a cross section right X and Z, and I, I set off this exploding spot at this location X two and Z two. All right. Got constant velocity. All right. So here's an equation for how this wave field expands. Okay. And of course it's going to expand circularly. Okay. So uh, you know x minus x two uh, quantity squared plus z minus z two quantity squared is equal to the velocity squared times the time squared, right? Um, so here I've expressed it uh, as you can see as the equation of a circle, right? This is a circle in the x z plane. Okay. Uh, however, what it, you know I'm recording at some and I want to downward continue to some constant z level. So, so what if I make z constant and I let t vary? So I want to look at this same exploding spot now in the xt plane. Okay, I want to look at it in the seismic section, the time section, instead of in the cross section. All right. So I just rearrange this uh, right in, in this equation for the circle. Right, uh, x is variable, z is variable. X two and Z two are, are constants. T is variable. V is a constant. Okay, but this uh, you know this is a circle at some constant, uh, and not at not at sorry not at variable time, but at some given constant time, right? T, then we get the equation of a circle. All right. So now we'll let T vary, right? And so I'm going to move it over to the left side of the equation, and I'm going to Take this z, and I'm going to make it constant, right? And uh, z two is still a constant, so I'm going to, you know, this is all constant now. Z minus z two is all constant now. You know, whatever level I downward continue to, that's a constant. That's z. So I move that to the right side of the equation, and on the on the left side now, I've got the variable stuff, which is v squared t squared, right? V is constant, t is variable, minus the quantity x, which is variable, minus x two. Uh, which is constant quantity squared. That's equal to z, which is constant minus z two, which is constant. Right. So the whole right side is is uh, is is constant. So now this looks like the equation for a hyperbola. Okay, and it's just exactly what you would expect, right? You solve for t, and that's one over v times the the square root of the quantity x minus x two squared plus uh, z minus z two squared. Okay, so that's a very simple uh, hyperbola. Um, so this exploding spot, you know, this exploding piece of reflector, is a circle in the uh, in the x z plane, and it's a hyperbola in the x t plane. Now I hope this makes sense. You know, if you if you have a uh, uh, you know if you run your site, you know, this is the the seismic section here, and if you run it over a diffractor. You get a, hy a hyperbola, okay, and this is the equation for it under constant velocity. So now, what happens to this hyperbola? You know, this is really drawn for z equals zero, okay. Z is constant and it's zero. What happens to the data as we downward continue as we as we go to higher um, uh, higher values? You know, deeper values of z. Okay, now now first I have this color. Uh, uh, color visualization, uh, where you know my my um, uh, my uh, seismic wave generator, you know, can't do infinite frequencies, so we have a an exploding spot that has a finite size. Okay, uh, so that's a little unrealistic, but uh, uh, but I think you can still see the idea. Okay, the model space is the cross section, right, which is what we're trying to 
we're trying to get a cross section, and there's the exploding spot, okay. And if you can imagine, you know, cutting back further and further in time, right, you would still have a circle, okay. But if you uh, if you look instead at the xt plane, which is what this is, all right, on the front here, the xt plane <coughs> is this hyperbola, right? Where the plane is cutting this hyperbola. So that's our data. That's our data set. But this, uh, you know, this whole cone here that we're either slicing in the direction where we get circles or the direction where we get hyperbolas, right? This whole cone is a, um, uh, you know, it's just according to that very simple equation, right? Under constant velocity. So uh, uh, now, you know, I could, I could even, in in the uh, uh, now imagine that, you know, here I'm slicing it at at. Z equals zero, right? That's the front face here. Okay. What if I slice, you know, parallel, but deeper back on the z-axis? What what's it going to look like? You know, well, the hyperbola is going to move up. So here's what I tried. That's what I tried to draw down here. Okay. So we've got our service experiment. I got I got cross sections on the left, and I've got data sections on the right. Okay, and um, we got our service experiment. I, I put in two exploding spots. One's deeper than the other. Okay, and uh, you know here's just some rays to show you what's what's happening. All right. So here's the surface data uh, at z equals zero. Okay. We downward continue to z equals z one, which as you can see is not too deep. All right. The uh, hyperbolas move up and they they change shape. Right. They move. They move up in time. They move to a smaller time, which on these axes is up. Right? You can see that. Right here, time points down. If I slice deeper back, I'm going to be, you know, slicing this hyperbola. Say over here, it's going to move up. All right. And then, um, you know, I slice at uh, 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 at z equals z two. Right. So I'm right at this upper spot. So it's going to be a triangle then. You know, t is equal to one over v times the absolute value of x minus x two. Okay, which you can you know you can get that out of the uh, out of this uh, simple equation here. <clears throat> uh, and then uh, um, uh, if I slice deeper, you know, between uh, for at z three between the depth of the two spots. Okay, this one will actually appear in negative time. Um, and uh, and this one will appear uh, is still moving up and sharpening, okay. And you can get the same thing by you know slicing slicing into this volume. I should set this up in Open Detect, you know, so that we can actually uh, actually do it. This is using software from a long time ago, um, which has nice output, but uh, uh, can't use it anymore. Okay, so now I need to go to uh, sixteen. <clears throat> okay, here's another. Uh, here's a, here's some more examples of, of downward continuation. Okay, I, I I'm not telling you just yet how we're calculating it, but but it's it's still based on that cone, and just slicing that cone in different places, right? So here, you know. <clears throat> Like for the diffractor, that's the e the end of this reflector here. You know, here's the the model, and and notice everything here is in in time. That's the way that this one is is arranged. Okay, so here's the model presented in time instead of depth, but it's still a still a depth model. Okay, and each diffractor in the data set, you know, leads gives you a hyperbola, and these the like these little step discontinuities along the dipping layer. Each one is generating a hyperbola. Okay. Now I don't I don't know if you can see it, but there's this little uh, tick at the little arrow at the uh, on the right hand side. That's telling you the depth to which this is downward continuing. All right. So this is kind of how <clears throat> um, you know how we're uh, uh, representing it. 
Let's see. Oh boy. Okay. Um, not sure how to change the uh, the uh, scrolling mode, but that's okay. Um, so we've got, uh, um, you know, here's what we're after, right? And here's the the zero uh, zero offset, zero depth data set. Okay, so we've down we haven't downward continued at all yet. That's the raw data. Now we downward continue almost to this first reflector, and you can see that the hyperbolas are coming up. They're collapsing, right? We downward continue past uh, most of the, the the dipping structure. All right, still you know it's all collapsed now, and we're we're collapsing these ones that are deeper. Uh, we're downward continuing toward the top here, and we can see the hyperbolas are collapsing. We go down below, we've collapsed everything. Okay. Uh, here's uh, here's an example that I computed. This one is different uh, than uh, than the uh, the one before because. Um, uh, my example here includes multiple reflections. Okay, this is a you know real computation. All right, so this is a little more complicated. Right, let's look at the data set. Right, depth zero meters. Okay, you got the reflector, uh, the flat parts and the dipping parts. Right, there's the flat parts, the dipping parts, and all the diffractions from the sides of the model, from the ends of the reflectors. You know, all the diffractions are there. Okay, then at twice Right here's you know one times the reflection time. This is at exactly twice the time. So these things down here, those are those are multiples of the upper reflection. Okay. And uh, uh, <clears throat> then here, you know, here's the uh, the second reflector. That's that's there. That's there. Um, right. And this so that's uh, right twice the. It's and that's confused with the multiple right. Uh, twice this time here is um, uh, I think down here. So the uh, the multiple of the dipping the end of the dipping reflector is confused with the second reflector. Okay, and you can see there's bow ties you know throughout this right. It's uh, you know there's all this confusion of multiple reflections and and the uh, and as well as the uh, um, uh, you know, not just multiple reflections, but also the uh, the the confusions between the depth points and the midpoints. Right? It's all coming out as these bow ties. So here's the the reflector, you know, and its bow tie that's from the the sort of uh, um, you know syn synformal structure. Okay. So we move down to, and the whole thing is only 200 meters depth, right? So we moved down to 26 meters, and we've almost collapsed the uh, uh, the reflections here. Okay, we go down to 50 meters. Right here, things are uh, are 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 moving. You know, they're they're uh, well. Actually, see, I, I they're moving up towards zero time. Okay, so you see everything's moving up, and when it gets you know here, this this diffraction here. Is at the it's become a triangle. It's almost at zero time. Okay, and now you know the multiple. Uh, the multiple it's not collapsed, right? It's actually uh, turned up. So that's one way to tell multiples from uh, um, from the uh, um, the direct reflections. And then here's the uh, you know we're still moving up with that second reflection, and now. Uh, you know, there's an artifact down here, which is the uh, uh, the rest of it, uh, which is the you know the way over corrected data. Okay, and uh, and now we're at the level of the second reflector. Okay, and there's the bottom. You know, started to collapse. All right. So now, if I if for every level I take off the top at zero time, right? That's my imaging condition. I take off the top. Trace at zero time, the top row at zero time. So this is the this is the the image at 26 meters, at 50 meters, 76 meters, 100 meters, okay, uh, 120 meters, right? And I, I arrange all those. Here's the migration, okay. It's it's had the downward continuation plus the imaging condition applied, okay. 
So here's the migration of that data set that includes multiples. And you can see the flat reflector, the dipping reflector. You can see that the, the multiples are overcorrected. And here's a second reflector and the synformal structure. What are we missing? We're missing the, steeply, the more steeply dipping parts. Okay, And there's a third multiple in there. Way too complex. Okay, So that's, uh, uh, that's what downward continuation will actually do. Um, and, and to achieve a migration here under these civil conditions, we just lop off the top row and we arrange those top rows, you know, 26 meters, 50 meters, 120, okay, se you know, 76, 120, and, and so forth. And, those, and if we put them all in there, all 200, then, uh, then there it is, okay, including the, the, the munged up multiples. All right.